Welcome to the latest episode of our podcast series for financial advisors. Today's episode is Betting on the Long Term. Former Merrill resident director shares why her billion dollar team broke away. It's a conversation with Melissa Bouchelon, CFP, and managing partner of Soundview Wealth Advisors. I'm Mindy Diamond, and this is Mindy Diamond on Independence. This podcast is available on our website, diamond-consultants.com and on advisorhub.com, as well as Apple Podcasts and other major podcast platforms. If you are not already a subscriber and want to be notified of new show releases, please subscribe right on your favorite podcast platform or on the episode page on our website. And if you find the content in this series to be useful and know others who could benefit from it, please feel free to share it widely. There's no doubt that the wirehouses provide a solid foundation for building a wealth management business. In fact, a recent Fidelity study shows that these massive firms employ some of the industry's most productive advisors. Yet for all that the big brokerages offer, advisors are still feeling limited in their ability to serve their clients and grow their businesses as they see fit. And regardless of the ties that bind them, movement out of the space continues to rise. For example, my guest on this episode was a producing manager at Merrill, running their office in Savannah, Georgia. As resident director and market leader, Melissa Bouchelon's role was to encourage advisors to sell bank products to their clients. Yet over time, her marching orders from the bank started to feel manipulative, the weight of which she could no longer take. In a conversation with her husband, Kelly, who was part of the team, they came to the following conclusion. If we're going to do this for the next 20 years, I know it can't be here at Merrill. So in March of 2018, they made the leap to independence, launching Soundview Wealth Advisors in Savannah. But it wasn't all that simple. They had one member of their team in Merrill's Retire in Place Program, or CTP, and would need cash up front to repay the firm. Plus, they made a conscious decision to leave $150 million of their billion dollar in assets behind. How did they do it? And was it all worth it? I asked Melissa that and more. So let's get to it. (music) Melissa, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm happy to be here. Thanks, Mindy, for having me. You bet. So tell us a little bit about yourself. That's probably a good place to start. Absolutely. Well, I am uh, originally from New Jersey, hence no sweet Southern accent. But I have been down south in Savannah, Georgia for over 25 years. I'm the managing partner at Soundview Wealth Advisors. I live on Skidaway Islands with my husband, daughter, and a dog, cat, and two guinea pigs and a horse. And so, ah, um, <laughs> that's a full house. A full house, to say the least. Yeah. And what brought you from New Jersey to Savannah? That's a good question. My father was a Guatemalan immigrant, so I was the first person to have the ability to go to college in my family. And so I had to go where I got the most scholarship money. So at the age of 17, I came down to down south and to South Carolina in particular, sight unseen to start college. Ended up going to undergrad and graduate school in South Carolina and then moved to Georgia in 2000. Wow. Now, you and your team left Merrill in October of 2017, and I want to focus on that that journey from Merrill to independence. But where were you? What did you do before Merrill Lynch? So before Merrill Lynch, I spent about four years teaching, and I taught regular ed, special ed, and gifted. And my undergrad was mixed. I had a psychology undergrad, but I'd always taken business classes. And what I realized, as much as I loved teaching and education, I wanted to make a change. And so back in 02, I was kind of soul searching and trying to figure out what would I be good at, kind of taking the psychology, the education background, and then the love of problem solving and financial advice and advisor sort of just made sense. So I knew that I needed to either get a job with Goldman Sachs or Merrill Lynch because they had the best training programs in the industry. And in 2002, neither were hiring new advisors. And so by 2004, they had opened up their training program. And I actually started at Merrill Lynch in the training program in 2004. 
interesting. You know, there's something to that. You are the third or fourth advisor I've spoken to in the last decade or so that started their career as a teacher and morphed into becoming a financial advisor and a very successful one at that. So there must be something to it. But let's look at the time at Merrill. So you were at Merrill from 04 in the training program. And I know you and your team left Merrill in March of 2018 to go independent and form Soundview Wealth Advisors. Give us a little perspective. How many were on your team when you left Merrill and how much was the team managing in assets at the time? Yeah, absolutely. We were a team of 10 individuals with over 100 years of industry experience combined. Interestingly enough, all the advisors on our team, and there were five of us, had started at Merrill Lynch in the training program. Uh, when we left, we were managing just over a billion in assets under management, but that was measured a bit differently than it is in the independent space because it included mortgages, loans, it included life insurance, other items that we don't consider today. But one part of our strategy when we did leave, we knew that we were going to shrink to grow and our goal wasn't to bring every client in every household. It was to bring every client in every household that really wanted us to serve as their true fiduciary. What did that look like? So it went from being considered a billion-dollar team, which is you know the pinnacle of being a top advisor, to what did it shrink to when you left? It shrunk to about $850 million. Was that hard to do, just psychologically, to go from that ultimate threshold of a billion down to $850 million? I think the psychology of an advisor is assets under management, assets under management. The psychology of an entrepreneur is a bit different. It's building an entity that you can serve your clients and serve them in the way they expect to be served, where you can truly put them first, and then also focusing on revenue and not so much assets under management. Assets under management matters. But what really matters is that we could create a firm that clients would come to and we'd be able to serve them moving forward. And so it's a, it is a mindset shift and it does involve risk and it's very different than 20 years ago where there's assets under management. How, you know, how much do you have an assets under management? It was a shift, but we were able to get over that hurdle. And that came early on. We knew the only way to be successful as entrepreneurs and as an RIA was to bring over the right clients. Yeah. You know, actually, that's a really simple point, but a really interesting one. Because when you spend your life in the wirehouse world, it absolutely is about assets, 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 and grow those assets, assets, assets. And in order to be independent and as a fiduciary, your mindset really does have to shift. And so how do you think you got there? What do you think was most responsible for making that mindset shift from drinking the Kool-Aid of asset growth and only asset growth to really building the right firm the right way to serve clients? I would say it was something that was that shift was easier for us because we operated within Merrill Lynch very much from a client center focus. And we always believed that if we put clients first, did the right things, growth would happen. So we were very much, you know, sort of a fee-based annuitized practice, very much planning-based. And we always viewed Merrill Lynch as an open architecture and a conduit for our services. And really, before the bank owned Merrill Lynch, it had that entrepreneurial spirit. And so you could operate and create your own firm sort of within the larger broker-dealer. And as long as you were successful, they sort of left you alone. And so we always had the mindset of, you put the client first and the growth would happen. And we were thankful it did. But in the industry, after you know the bank bought Merrill Lynch, we were worried. We were nervous, and we thought that we may see some changes because there's really never been a successful acquisition of a broker-dealer into a bank where things didn't change a whole lot. And at first, it was okay because they kept a lot of the old guard, but we slowly started to see those changes. And so it was easy to kind of make the shift because in 2016, we just knew that if we were going to be doing this for another 20, 25 years, we needed to control our own destiny. We needed to create the best platform for our clients and the bank wasn't it anymore. Yeah. And I want to come back to that a little more about sort of what drove the decision to leave Merrill. But let's give our listeners, if you would, just a little more perspective. So tell us a little bit about the role you played on your team when you were at Merrill and the role you play now in Soundview. So I've always worn several different hats at Merrill. And so 
I was the senior resident director at Merrill Lynch. So I ran an office, had about $2 billion in assets under management. I was responsible for the compliance, responsible for the individual teams, helping them with their growth, helping to kind of drive firm initiatives, right? Within the uh, local office, which had about 30 people. I was also what I guess in their final iteration, they called the role of market champion. And what that really was, was someone that would help with the integration between the bank and all their different lines of business and Merrill Lynch. And at first, it started off as sort of a neat role and a great opportunity because you found out all the, the different things that you could do to help a client, right, across all lines of business. And it, it was great because the discussion was client focused. At the end, it really became a spreadsheet counting a bunch of referrals that were going back between business banking and mortgage and wealth management. And it was full of green, red, and yellow. And it wasn't about the client. It was about numbers and tick marks for the bank. And so that was a part of my role. And then I've always been client facing. So I've always worked directly with clients, helping them build financial plans and managing their investments, helping them with estate planning. And so I've always worn several different hats. And then you know, at Soundview, we were fortunate that I had had over 10 years of management experience because I was able to then come on board. I'm the managing partner at Soundview Wealth Advisors, and I also still work with clients. So I get to do my two out of my three favorite things, <laughs> create the culture for the firm and work with my clients. Lucky you. And again, I want to come back to that notion of sort of how it felt to be in that role of feet in two lands, a producing manager, if you will, at Merrill. But you work with your husband. And as you know, I think I work with mine as well. What's that like? Well, as long as I'm the managing partner, all goes smoothly. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just kidding. It's actually great. And, you know, it's all we've ever known, but it, it also... Our business is is tough and there is no nine to five, right? When you're helping people with their lives, their issues come up round the clock. And so we understand each other. We understand what our days look like and we celebrate successes together. When we've had difficult days, nobody understands it better than he does for me. and, And I think he'd say the reverse. So it actually, it works. And I think our partners would say that too, which is, I think, a real, a real testament. Yeah, I would say the same. There are days where it's challenging, but it would be challenging to work with anyone. And we share each other's successes. We are each other's cheerleaders. And ultimately, that's a good thing. Definitely. So I want to hear what was going on at Merrill that drove you to independence. So I get the fact, and we hear all the time, that people loved Merrill Lynch, that it was, it felt like it was a best in class infrastructure. It was a great platform. It was some of the best advisors and managers in the industry. It had an entrepreneurial culture that as long as you were successful in doing the right thing, they left you alone. And then a lot of that changed when the bank came in. So I get that. But still, big leap to go from whole career at Merrill Lynch to going independent. So what was going on at the time other than just change in bank culture? Well, the change in culture was huge, but obviously, you know, the drive towards what do clients want? What do you want when you hire someone? You want somebody who's going to look out for your best interest, right? Whether it's your plumber, your attorney, your the person that you're engaging with to purchase a sailboat. I mean, you want somebody that's going to put you first. And the only way we could truly do that was to become a registered investment advisor and to go independent. And it was becoming more and more obvious that that's what clients expected. And they were feeling like they weren't getting, right? And the bank's policies, yes, that all got in the way and made it harder in the cultural shift. But at the end of the day, we had to, if we were going to be in this business and in this industry moving forward, we had to be what clients expected us to be not kind of look, seem, and feel like a registered investment advisor. We had to be an investment advisor and be their fiduciary. Were you hearing complaints from clients or it was more just instinctively you felt limited in some way? Well, clients would say that it was harder to do business, right? It felt more institutional and less customized. I mean, we used to have people in the community look for us and they would look up our name, you know, Bouchelon and Ham Group. And they'd look for us in the phone book because that's how much we were able to independently brand ourselves. And it really felt like a boutique within this larger institution. It was shifting and changing. It was becoming more and more cumbersome and institutionalized for clients, the experience. And then it was also becoming watered down. When you looked 
you know, Merrill Lynch did a pretty good job being a, a, as true an open architecture platform as you could be. And then the bank started to reverse that course and they were shifting and we were reducing the number of fund families that we could work with and reducing the number of access to managers that we had access to. And so, you know, clients, we kept it as comfortable as we could for clients, but I do think they noticed it. And then you just knew that the industry was changing too. And so again, being forward looking, rather than feeling like you were an entrepreneur within a corporation, we decided we wanted to truly be an entrepreneur and controlling your culture is a big thing. It's a big thing from the client perspective and then also from an employee satisfaction perspective. Yeah, that sort of goes along with what we say to advisors, we counsel all the time that a move is about pushes and pulls, that nobody would be open to considering a move anywhere if there weren't certain frustrations that were bothering them. Those are the pushes. And that if they weren't equally, if not greater, excited by what was pulling them elsewhere. And it sounds like that really was it for you, that there were limitations that you were noticing where you were that began to make you feel like you were limited in the way you could serve clients best. And then as you looked out and realized sort of what you wanted for yourselves and the business and your clients, you realized that perhaps there could be something better. No question. Let me ask you one other question about that. Most advisors that practice in the wirehouse, and again, not just Merrill, any major firm, feel that it's open architecture enough, that unless they're working with the most ultra high net worth client who needs something really esoteric or really specialized, for the most part, even though the number of fund families or managers might be shrinking, it's still more than good enough. Did you not find that? So you can always find a solution, right? It may not be the best solution, but you can always find a solution. But if you're really trying to accomplish what's best for your clients, having the access does make a difference. And then there's the cost structure too that's involved for clients. And and there's no question that as we went through the transition and we did the mutual fund exchanges, we were able to get clients even access to the same funds, but for less, or the same managers, but for less. So that was one piece of it. But then secondly, if you think about in a large organization that's 15,000 financial advisors, they're creating a platform that's managed to the lowest common denominator and isn't customized to the clients that you're working with. When we were creating Soundview Wealth Advisors, we did it with our end user in mind and the people that we work with. So everything from the custodian we use to the platform that we use for planning, all of these different pieces we could construct with what did it look like and what was best for our clients, which may be very different from another registered investment advisory firm that works with a different type of individual. And so I think that customization the makes a huge difference. So when you think open architecture, I would even say think beyond just access to a variety of different investments, but it's the tools that you get to use as a whole. Can you give us some specific examples of what some of those tools are or some of those solutions are that you have access to now that you didn't then? Absolutely. First, take it from a planning perspective. Before we had kind of very basic Monte Carlo simulations that we can run. Now we can really do deep dive cash flow analysis we can run all of the Monte Carlos. We can show them on a cash flow basis. We can stress test the portfolios in a way that we couldn't before. We have risk analytics software where we can go in and test the portfolios that we construct and then how they would perform in a variety of environments, hyperinflation, um, you know, a typical recession, a recession that looks similar to the Great Recession in 2008. And so we're able to, as we're constructing portfolios, do better stress testing. We're also able for clients to kind of model some of their fears if they're concerned about what will happen if, right? And you fill it in. We can kind of show them the outcome and then show them how we built the portfolio to help provide a buffer in that type of environment. We didn't have anything that came close to that before. From an estate planning perspective, there was very little available within uh, Merrill Lynch to really help with that. Now we've got really pretty incredible estate planning software where we can really help illustrate for a client the impact of the planning that they're doing, not just for them, but for multiple generations. Yeah. And how about from a communication and branding standpoint? I know one of the things we hear from 
breakaway advisors is this sense of enormous freedom and excitement in being able to message and communicate and brand themselves in a way they couldn't where they were. No question. That's always exciting. And again, it comes down to, you know, creating that culture, creating that brand and being able to communicate with clients in the way that they would expect in a timely fashion and have it not feel so canned, right? So yeah, you had access to a newsletter before, but it would come out and it would always be branded and everybody's looked the same, but you just insert a different advisor picture. Well, we're able to customize our communications now as an example, kind of being Uh, you know, months into this pandemic, going through this, we were able to be extremely nimble in a way that we couldn't have been before. And we were able to communicate with clients much quicker, much more easily than if I had been still at a wirehouse. A perfect example is we decided to move the week of March 13th, we decided to move most of our operations remote. And so sent everybody home that Monday, on their way home, they picked up printers, They went home with their laptops, scanners, and the next morning, all of our calls were rerouted. The same people were answering the calls. For clients, it was a seamless transition. They noticed nothing different. We were able to access technologies for teleconferencing and video conferencing immediately. Because of what was occurring, we recognized the need for communication to be much more frequent. And so instead of just a monthly uh, note that would go out to clients and a quarterly newsletter, we increased it to a weekly communication. And so that level of being able to customize and be so nimble and be able to react so quickly to pivot just doesn't exist in a larger organization. And how did your clients react? Did they notice? It was seamless. So to them, they weren't panicked. They were calm and they felt good. They felt confident. Mm -hmm. And with confidence comes greater trust. And then as they're talking to their friends that are still trying to figure out where their advisor is or get in touch with them, they're explaining their experience. And so that also helps from a referral perspective as well. Yeah. Are you guys back in your office now? Just for perspective for our listeners, we record this in mid-November, month eight of the COVID crisis. And are you working at home or is the team working at home? Where is, what's that like now? So we've always had uh, both offices open throughout the pandemic. We've just had limited staffing. And so to this day, we're still operating with a limited number of people in the offices. And every time we think we're going to go back and kind of get to the next stage, something happens related to COVID that kind of just says, you know what, slow down. We're still effective. We will meet with clients if they really feel like they need a face-to-face meeting. Most of our clients are still very comfortable just utilizing video conferencing The second option is if they really want to see us face-to-face, we try to do a lunch or a breakfast outdoors. Mm -hmm. And if they're insistent on a face-to-face again, we will do that. But that's been a handful of people a handful of times. And so we are still very much kind of working in that hybrid model. But, you know, it's worth noting if there are Merrill advisors listening, Merrill advisors are still not allowed back in their office and they are still not allowed to meet with clients. So what I hear you saying is it's the option to have decided and customized not just what you have access to and how you communicate with clients, but to customize the way in which you deal with COVID as well. Exactly. Which makes you nimble, which makes you accessible. And that's what clients want. So let me ask you another question. You know, you're a young team and that's a trend we're really witnessing now where advisors are choosing independence much earlier in their careers than in previous years. And what I mean by that is previously, probably before a decade ago, a young team, so a team in their 30s or 40s that had at least a 10, 15, 20 year runway left to retirement would have opted to monetize the business by way of moving to another traditional firm and getting paid a recruiting package, and then said, ah, I can go independent nine, 10 years later. I've got a long career ahead of me. And now we're seeing a trend of advisors like you moving earlier in their career. So skipping over, leapfrogging that, I'll monetize the business, move from Merrill to UBS or or something of the sort, and going independent. What do you think about that? I think it's a very real trend and it's because there's a greater difference between, I believe, independence and what the broker dealer space is looking like. So when you went back to a comparison of the old Merrill and the entrepreneurial spirit, 
it was easier to kind of roll from one to the other and still feel like you could serve clients in the way that they were accustomed to putting them first. And you weren't a fiduciary, but it still felt okay enough. And now it doesn't anymore. So I think when people look to the future of where is wealth management going, where do clients expect you to be, where where can you grow the most, not in the short term, but over the long term and serve your clients best, it's independence. And I think people like controlling their own destiny. They're willing to give up the short-sighted reward today, right? And getting the big check and getting locked in because that locked in comes with a price. While they've got you locked in, they're changing the game, right? And they're changing the structure. And like it or not, you're stuck. That's not what clients want. Clients don't want you stuck. They want you in a place that you believe is the best place for them, not for you. Absolutely true. But I think still there are a lot of advisors that want to believe that they're not stuck, that it's, again, open architecture enough. They're not hurting clients. There's really nothing they can't do for clients. But I think a lot of it comes down to you don't know what you don't know. You assume it's more than good enough. You're doing your best work for clients until a lot of them go out and look and touch and feel and compare and contrast what's possible elsewhere until they really begin to see what they might be missing. I think that's true. You don't know what you don't know. There's no question. But I think because of a lot of what the the larger institutions are doing, it's feeling more limited and it's forcing people to go out and see what the alternatives are. Yeah, I think it's definitely getting where that battle of control is being won by the firm. The balance of power is really shifted to the firm and not the advisor, and the advisors are voting with their feet. I think you're right about that. Melissa, when you were thinking about leaving Merrill, and I think you mentioned that you made the decision to leave in October of 17 and then actually left in March of 18, but what other options or were there any other options that you considered besides independence? We actually wanted to consider everything and weigh the pros and cons because none of us had ever moved before. We never moved to get a check. Like I had mentioned, we all went through the training program at Merrill Lynch. And back in 2005, 2006, we probably would have told you we'd be there forever. So we did consider other broker dealers, but we felt very quickly that you're just moving from one organization to another. There was no change and no benefit to, to clients. And so that was completely off the list. We looked at other RIA models like Raymond James as an example. And again, we felt like, yeah, for now that might be okay until Raymond James sells their RIA book to a bank. And so again, we couldn't control our own destiny. We liked the idea of becoming, again, that true fiduciary independence, becoming an entrepreneur. And we had to consider, okay, do we do it on our own completely independently? And that was attractive, right? But it's also important to recognize that we had to, as you had mentioned before, kind of, you know what you know, but you don't know what you don't know. And I, although I had run several offices for Merrill Lynch, I had never run an RIA. And I still had a responsibility to my clients and to the firm to make sure that I was doing my day job. And so that it would be really difficult to create and build a firm like we built without some help. And so From there, we started to weigh out, should we merge with an existing RIA, which seemed really attractive because it was all already built for you, right? And you can just make the transition. But then when we started to think about 20 years down the line and what we wanted to create and what we wanted to do, and really our own growth strategy, we wanted to be an RIA that was built for the clients that we work with, that really we were able to kind of recreate the culture that we had within our team, but make it now our business, right? Our own business, and then be able to attract other advisors and sort of be that solution for people who felt the same way we did, but maybe didn't have the number of people on their team where they could accomplish it or the skill set or the desire to, to really truly run their own business. And so we realized merging with another RIA probably didn't make sense because you wouldn't have been able to create all those things that got us really excited. And then it came down to really looking at, you know, the focuses and the dynasties of the world. And, and really with focus, we liked the people. We liked their long-term investment mindset and being, um, being a partner with you. You know, in the beginning, they offered lots of help on the front end to determine whether or not it would be viable. And then they helped us build it and build it while we were still working our day jobs. 
And then when we finally rolled out on March 23rd, you know, what was so incredible is we were a firm that was not even a day old, but we felt like we'd been around for a decade. And I don't think we would have been able to accomplish that by ourselves. And just the coverage that we got from the Wall Street Journal and from media and the power of that message with clients really resonated and helped create a successful transition. And you get one chance at that. And we didn't want to risk it by hopefully being able to do it successfully alone. Yeah. So for the benefit of our listeners, Soundview is associated with Focus Financial Partners. And Focus Financial Partners is the publicly traded largest investor in the independent space. So you talk about what made you choose Focus, but I do have a question for you. There is no question that the majority of advisors, breakaway advisors who go independent today, choose to associate with some sort of service provider or platform firm to turnkey the getting from here to there. And because they know what you don't to avoid any mistakes because you get one shot at it. I agree with that. Focus was around before Dynasty was. But Dynasty is a model that does similar things to Focus, but without taking an equity stake. So what was it that made you choose, I guess, Focus over Dynasty? And what made you feel that selling a chunk of equity was the right thing to do? Well, when you invest in something, first and foremost, you care so much more about the outcome. So that long-term mindset was important to us. So that saying, hey, were we looking to figure out the best deal, so to speak, right? No. Is there a give up? Absolutely, right? Because now we've got to share our growth moving forward in perpetuity with focus. But with that said, we went into this knowing that, okay, we've got options and we can partner with anybody. And who do we want? Well, the focus team and the focus people we felt we had the most confidence in helping kind of get us started and get us off the ground. But because they were going to be in a long-term investor in our firm, they were going to care to make sure, not that we were, okay, we're successful, but the growth and the success would continue. Having the access to the capital, having the access to the group of advisors, because kind of going back, you know, there's pros and cons to every situation. And there was a lot of good at Merrill Lynch. And one of the things our team really liked was the ability to collaborate with the advisors that were kind of the best in the industry, right? And share ideas. And we didn't want to lose that. We didn't want to become some sleepy old uh, RIA in Savannah, Georgia. Just We were cutting edge when we left in 2018, but 30 years later, we're still doing the same thing. And so when we looked at the caliber of firms that Focus had invested in, it was incredible. And so, yeah, we needed to roll out and create a firm that would be a billion dollars. But then when we want to grow from a billion dollars to five billion dollars, I have colleagues and people that I can call on and lean into to help and to just brainstorm with. And we felt that that was really important and critical moving forward. And then obviously, too, as we are looking and our, our forward looking strategy towards growth, as other advisors come to join us and as we merge and look at other RIAs to potentially come join Soundview Wealth Advisors, having the access to the capital having access to that same team that can help us do the due diligence around whether or not it's a good fit. And then even being able to construct our own sort of packages for people so that when they come over, rather than having to opt for the CTP or transition program at a Merrill Lynch or a Morgan Stanley, they can have that sort of same retire out ability through an RIA like ours. And so there's always a give up, right? And there's pros and cons to both, but we felt very strongly that Focus was the right firm to help us accomplish what we wanted to. And I assume fair to say that if you didn't believe that the value they could add, both upon transition and in helping you get from one to five billion, if you didn't believe that that value was greater than what you'd be giving up, I assume you wouldn't have done it. No question, especially when we plan to work another 25 years. You know, So it's, we have a very long-term mindset and we wanted a partner who had that as well. Yeah. You also mentioned to me offline, Melissa, that you had an advisor on your team at Merrill that had just gone into CTP. And for anybody not familiar, CTP is Merrill's career transition program, and it is essentially a retire in place program for a senior advisor to monetize his life's work and for the next gen to inherit that business. So 
I want to hear about how that affected your decision to choose focus, but perhaps first, the CTP and programs like it, equivalent programs like it at UBS and Morgan and actually any major firm are the ways in which, one of the ways in which the big firms are using to attempt to really bind advisors to the firm, to incent them to sign on to CTP or programs like it earlier and to really take away optionality from the next gen once they've signed on. So would love to hear what your thought is about that in terms of what your advice might be or how you might have thought about being the next-gen inheritor to somebody considering CTP. At the time, and when we did it, the programs have changed some, and and it was much more focused because we had done it, I think it was a four-year program, so you figure 2014. It was less of kind of that lock-up, hey, gotcha, next-gen advisor, and really more of a way to make sure that a senior advisor wouldn't have to leave again to monetize their book and that they keep the clients at the firm and transition them to the next gen. And we had a great advisor that I had worked with in both offices that I had, I had managed at Merrill Lynch and she was getting close to retirement. And so it made sense from a fit within our team. When I kind of, if you fast forward to the CT packages of today, they're very different. They're exactly what you had just mentioned. It's a, yeah, here we're giving an attractive package to the advisor that's retiring out so they can monetize their book. But really what we're trying to do is lock down. And if you look at the terms and the conditions of those packages today versus when we entered into them, they're much more restrictive and much more of a lockup because they are using it as a tool in a way to kind of keep the next gen in their seat and stuck. So it's definitely evolved over the last five, six years as to how firms are using them from a strategy perspective. In our case, I would say using focus and having a CTP advisor had nothing to do with one another in our case. What what really was important for us as related to the uh, CTP advisor is that we felt very strongly that we wanted to honor our commitment to her and she was going to retire at the end of February in 2018. So she could know nothing about anything that was happening. But then also we wanted to get her to retirement and get her out so she didn't have to be kind of left behind. And then we leave, you know, we didn't want to do that to her. And then we felt very strongly because she was a committed 35 plus year veteran at Merrill Lynch, very committed and dedicated to her clients. We felt strongly about making sure that the clients that she had entrusted us with, we could at least call and reach out to. So when we left and we made the transition, we were in the last year of our commitment. If we had waited one more year, we would have been able to just add her clients to the protocol list and call them. But we did end up having to write Merrill Lynch a check in order to have the ability to at least call her clients and let them know we had moved to Sound Wealth Advisors. And we just felt strongly about that. Again, you get one reputation, right? And so if you do the right thing, we're big believers that it works out. And so focus wasn't a driving force around the CTP piece. So let's pivot a second to growth of Soundview. I know you recently opened a new office in March of this year. How did that come about and did the pandemic impact those plans? Yes, we knew that we would end up being a multi-office firm. And what happened is there was an advisor at a bank that we had known and professionally respected for years and actually even used to joke and say, we need to get her on our team over at Merrill Lynch. And uh, an opportunity came up where she was able to move. So we wanted to take advantage of that opportunity. She lived in Statesboro, Georgia. We have clients in Statesboro, Georgia. And so it just, and she has clients in Statesboro, Savannah, and all over the country. And so it just made a lot of sense to go ahead and provide a local office for her in Statesboro, which this all came about, let's see, middle of March was when we really started to kind of talk to her. And by April, she was hired and we had an office open and outfitted amidst the pandemic. We actually opened an office and hired an analyst and a new advisor during the pandemic and did not miss a beat. It was pretty incredible. 
And what was it for her? I mean, she had the same waterfall of possibilities she could have considered as well. Obviously, she knew you and liked you, and that was a plus for joining Soundview. But what prevented her from either forming her own independent firm or going to any one of the models today, firms like Rockefeller is having so much success or RBC or JP Morgan Securities or any of the wirehouses? So she was actually in discussions with a lot of a lot of different people and had a few different offers. And then we called her. Right. And upon meeting with us, she just she and this, these are her words, not mine. She just realized that what she was always trying to accomplish with her clients within the confines of the structure she worked in, she could do with ease at Soundview. And there was no question. She knew this was going to be, she had been with her bank since she graduated from college, the bank she'd worked with. And so this was, again, one of those circumstances where she was going to move and move once and wanted to be able to look her clients in the eye and say, this is the best place for you and here's why. She just had that sense and that feeling pretty immediately for all the reasons we kind of talked about, right? The customization, the all of the noise and all of the structure and the policy and procedures that are put in the in place not to help the client but to serve the institution really don't exist and so she she came on board pretty easily and pretty quickly i mean it was you know just it's it's it just it was sort of no question to her that doesn't come easily and certainly not something that not the conclusion that everybody would come to well i mean we, we talk to a lot of advisors that love what independence stands for but in a perfect world, they walk away from X amount of unvested deferred comp, or they have you know, some major financial obligation coming up, or they've got young kids and they know they've got college ahead of them, or a retirement to protect, or for one reason or another, the short term really matters. And the short term economics of moving to any other model besides independent would have been much sexier then I presume what you might have offered her. I would say, yes, anybody who moves to independence isn't necessarily doing it just for the biggest check or the biggest opportunity or the biggest amount of cash flow right up front. So there has to be more to it. And longer term, they really believe that it's the place that has the most, most growth potential. But one of the, the things that we've tried to structure and in building our firm, and this varies from investment advisory firm to investment advisory firm, and this is one of the reasons we felt really strongly about creating our own, is that we wanted to be a place that advisors could come to, and it wouldn't only benefit the senior partners or the equity owners, that it would really be an opportunity where somebody who was successful as an advisor and a broker dealer could come and financially still have have benefits. And that's where we can leverage Again, the help of focus there in how we structure deals and our own our own packages for advisors that we choose to bring into the fold. And then also we feel it's really important that people get paid on the revenue that they're generating. So we want everybody to have the opportunity to grow, not just the, the senior partners. And so what other growth plans do you have for the firm, organic and inorganic both? Yes, we have been very uh you know, successful about just growing. And even in a year like this, we were hoping, okay, at least let's just maintain, right? And we've actually been able to hit our growth targets pretty tremendously. That's exciting. But also kind of as we look to the future, the plan is we really want to be sort of the preeminent wealth management investment advisory firm in the Southeast. So we're, how are we going to do that? And it's, it's really being an option for a lot of the people. It's, Not everybody is going to be positioned to come out and create their own RIA. And to go into a lot of RIAs, you aren't going to be able to necessarily have opportunities to become equity owners or really share in a large part of the the revenue you're generating. So we have structured our firm in a way that as advisors join us, they have that same opportunity to grow. And so I can see us over time continuing to expand different offices and our footprint across the low country would be sort of the, the starting point to that. And and we are now in a place where we're able to have those discussions and, and focus is really helpful in that because they can do a lot of the legwork and the due diligence in helping us analyze 
individuals that we're talking to and also other firms that might be really great potential merger opportunities. So I know you're just in the early days of Soundview with a long runway ahead of you, but any thoughts about what the end game for Soundview will be, your succession plans? So I hope Soundview long outlives me, right? And I think about the future and yeah, I think about, we, we actually have built in succession planning. If you even look at the ages of the, the people and the individuals at Soundview, we are kind of keeping that in mind and making sure that we do have people currently that can help Soundview as we grow. But there's no question that over time, there will be transitions and we're going to continue to build out that bench of who the future leaders are. We've, you know, I'm actually, we have one individual in particular that we're sort of grooming to kind of step on board and to help us run operations and compliance. Right now, I wear a lot of hats. The plan isn't for me to always wear all these hats. And so to continue to add people so that, you know, Soundview can far outlive any of us. Melissa, this has been such an exciting conversation, so interesting. But one final question. So with hindsight as your guide and any thoughts you might want to share with other advisors who are considering the leap? Good question. I would say I, you know, I wish we had done it sooner. Everybody says that. (laughs) I would say consider all the possibilities because then you'll know you'll just you'll just know the direction you'll weigh the pros and cons and you'll see what's right for your individual situation don't focus too much on the short-term gain uh really think long term and um and then just this is sort of an administrative piece just make making sure it's you know it's it's a change it's different it is the hardest thing i ever did and we ever did and and every advisor and every person on our team would say that but it is no question the best thing we ever did, Mm. you know, from a personal satisfaction standpoint, from a client satisfaction standpoint, from excitement about the future and the potential, the possibilities. So just do it. Yes. But make sure you research it and leverage experts and people that know and have been there and have been through it because you get one shot to do it right. And, and so uh, there's no question to do it. And then I'm just, just really, uh, I guess, you know, like I was saying, from an administrative standpoint, don't go into this thinking it, it'll be easy. There will be frustrations. You've got to learn new systems. You've got to learn new technologies. You're going to learn new paperwork. There's all of that. But that's going to come whether you go on your own and go independent. And that's going to happen whether you go to a new broker dealer. So, you know, really kind of make the decision that's best for you where you can control your own destiny and best for your clients, most importantly. Great advice. Thank you. Melissa, this has been a delightful conversation. As I mentioned, I'm grateful for your time and your wisdom. And we look forward to hearing and seeing more about all the great things Soundview is doing. Thank you so much, Mindy. Thanks for having me. Melissa shared so many words of wisdom, but I think the most compelling was her comment about the mindset shift required to be a successful independent. It's about going from the psychology of an advisor, which is focused on asset growth, to the psychology of a fiduciary, which is all about how to serve clients best. I thank you for listening, and I encourage you to visit our website, diamond-consultants.com, and click on the tools and resources link for valuable content. You'll also find a link to subscribe for regular updates to the series. And if you're not a recipient of our weekly email, Perspectives for Advisors, click on the blog link to browse recent articles. These written pieces are an ideal way to stay informed about what's going on in the wealth management space without expending the energy that full-on exploration requires. Feel free to email or call me if you have specific questions. I can be reached at 908 879-1002 or by cell at 973-476-8578 and finally by my email at mdiamond at diamond-consultants.com. Please note that all requests are handled with complete discretion and confidentiality. And again, if you enjoyed this episode, feel free to share it with a colleague who might benefit from its content. And a special thanks to AdvisorHub.com for sharing this podcast with your viewers and subscribers. 
This is Mindy Diamond on Independence. Independence.